Coming up in the next hour, Alphabet rakes in a huge win in its latest quarter, with Google bringing in marketing dollars despite costly regulatory trouble in Europe. We'll break it all down. Plus, all the other FANG stops are up on Alphabet's earnings beat as well. How the Google parents' earnings play into the broader tech momentum. Yet one tech titan had a rough start to the week, and that is Amazon. Why? President Trump once again taking aim at Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos and his ownership of the Washington Post. Details on that later this hour. But first to our top story, shares of Alphabet jumped as much as 6.1% in late hours trading. After reporting a strong second quarter, Google is still raking in marketing dollars from advertisers, giving the online search giant another strong quarter in the face of costly regulatory trouble in Europe. Alphabet reported second quarter sales of just above $26 billion. Analysts were expecting revenue of about $25 billion. Google's ad business grew 24%. Joining us now to break it all down, Forrester Research Analyst Colin Colburn, also with us, Bloomberg's Romaine Bostic. Uh, Romaine, let's start with uh, the expectation here. Google uh, released two different net income numbers, one including that $5 billion fine from the European Commission that they are appealing, one not including that fine. But investors don't seem to care. Uh, they're just looking at this revenue growth, which is strong. Yeah, the revenue growth was strong, and frankly, the EP was growth is strong even if you put back in that five billion dollar uh, fine uh, you know this is a company that basically showed over the past quarter that it's still writing its own story uh, you saw that not only in the revenue numbers but you saw it really in the components at the ad uh, spending uh, and frankly also with their cloud business uh, this is what investors were looking for and I think they came in uh, a lot hotter than some folks had expected and you're seeing that reflected in the stock after hours here now, Colin, uh, I just got off the phone with Ruth Porat, the CFO of Alphabet, and she talked about what is really driving this earnings strength, and she singled in on mobile. She said, we're going to talk about the ongoing strength in mobile in particular. One valuable point is we focus on innovation with mobile. We're going to see improvements on mobile, which can enhance growth across platforms, and we're going to continue to invest to support growth opportunities that we see, which is interesting given that we are seeing CapEx go up significantly again. I asked how long could that, that could keep going on, and she said, our view is it gives you a lens into our outlook for growth. Investment is supporting growth across the business. It's search and ads, it's newer business, it's the importance of machine learning. We are looking for additional compute capacity given the outlook for growth. Does the investment that Google is making across it, its platforms concern you, this rise in CapEx? No, it doesn't concern me at all. I mean, I think from an advertiser perspective, it's a great, it's a great thing um, because if you're if you're an advertiser and you've been spending in Google for upwards of 15 years at this point, um, you want even more innovation at, at, at this point. And I think you've seen it a little bit of them taking some of their advertising products, their advertising technology, and putting it together so it's more easy as an advertiser to buy uh, ads across YouTube, across Google Search, across all of Google's properties. Um, so more investment there, I think, I think is actually a good thing. It's I don't think it's something to really be too concerned about. It's ironic, uh, Romaine, given uh, the last week or so for Alphabet and, you know, the, the, the possibility that with this uh, European Commission ruling, Google uh, could be forced to pay handset makers a lot of money to support their apps going on these phones uh, pre-installed and could force Google to fundamentally change its business model. That's not something that Ruth Porat would get into on our call. Uh, she directed all the questions about the fine and about cloud as well uh, to Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, who is, um, you know, talking about uh, earnings as we speak. Let's talk a little bit about the cloud, Romaine, in particular. Google, uh, you know, is, is in third place right now, behind Microsoft, behind Amazon, but it's also rapidly growing territory. Um, how much do you think the cloud, in particular, could supercharge Alphabet growth going forward? Well, I, I could tell you, before this earnings season, I talked to a couple of analysts, and one thing that they were really looking for is for an ex not just an expansion of the cloud revenue, but really to see that there was a little bit more diversity uh, out of Alphabet's uh, 
uh, revenue and that they weren't just completely reliant on the ad space. And I think you're seeing that in these numbers. I mean, there are a few charts that are on the terminal that uh, I'm sure will make their way around that really shows that over the past few quarters, uh, their reliance on ad spending is dropping mildly, but they're finding other ways to sort of bring in revenue. And that's giving investors a little bit more to hang their head on. I mean, you talk about that fine, and I could tell you that a lot of investors sort of shrugged that off, uh, not only because the, the dollar amount really wasn't that impactful for a company with $100 uh, billion dollars in cash on their balance sheet, but also the fundamental changes that they could potentially have to make are still sort of esoteric and down the road. So for now, what you saw is investors coming into this earnings season uh, with a fairly confident that they were going to get an earnings beat. You saw that not only in the shares, you had a little bit of run up in the shares, but even when you look at the short interest in Google uh, over the past couple of months, it had really dropped. In fact, it's about the lowest that it's been since 2016. So you're seeing a lot more optimism about Alphabet, I should say, uh, than you've seen in quite a while. And Sundar Pichai spent a lot of time on the call talking about new cloud customers. He also spent five minutes talking about artificial intelligence um, and has gone to great lengths to position Google as a leader in AI. Colin, what do you make of that? No, I, I, I'm, I mean, they are. Uh, you know, you look at what they've done uh, in the advertising business. You look at uh, all of the companies that they've that they've bought up um, over the past few years. Um, they are one of the leaders when it comes to artificial intelligence. It's it's going to be interesting to see um, on the on the ad side how they uh, continue to evolve the the artificial intelligence and bring it into the to the ad experience and make better, more relevant ads for consumers. I mean, right now, uh, paid search on Google is probably one of the more engaging, relevant forms of advertising that that there is. Um, but even more artificial intelligence to be able to understand the customer a little bit better and tune the advertising better to a more a more personalized um, kind of ad, I think, is, is, is sort of the future state of where they're trying to bring it. I also want to talk about the other bets line item, which, you know, has over time been shrinking, though they did lose about $100 million more on other bets this quarter. But, but Porat told, told me it's historically lumpy you know we're not talking so much about google's moonshots aside from waymo which um, ruth porat went to great lengths to talk about how of uh, these other bets waymo in particular is one that she and they are most excited about uh, colin how optimistic are you about uh, waymo as uh, you know a, a true contributor uh, at some point to alphabet's overall business Oh man, a true contributor. Um, I guess <laughs> I, I guess it's a little bit of uh, broad language, but um, I think it's I think it's kind of far off. Um, you, you look at you just look at the breakdown today. Uh, the advertising business is it, it is Google's entire business for the most part, um, and and I think it's going to take some time. While while Waymo I think is in kind of later stages compared to other competitors in that space, um, it's still going to take some time for it to be a substantial part uh, or, or a, a big driver of of Alphabet's overall business. All right, Colin Colburn, analyst at Forrester Research. Thanks so much for joining us, Romain Bostic. You're going to be sticking with me. We're going to talk about the broader tech momentum ahead, and we'll continue to cover what is happening with Alphabet. Meantime, Dan Loeb's third point has cast a vote of, a vote of confidence in PayPal. The hedge fund has taken a stake in the payments processor, and in an investor letter obtained by Bloomberg, third point says PayPal shares could reach $125 within 18 months. That'd be more than 40% from where the stock is trading now. Up next, Alphabet is just for starters. Facebook, Amazon, and Twitter all report this week as well. We'll put the FANG stocks in focus next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Alphabet out with earnings. And just to recap, this was a home run quarter for Google, driven by mobile and YouTube. And after Netflix's earnings with last week, investors have been looking for Alphabet to jumpstart momentum for FANG stocks. Because remember, it's not just Alphabet reporting this week. S&P tech heavyweights, Facebook, Amazon, and Twitter all post as well. It follows from Netflix, which posted a conservative forecast for the rest of the year, disappointing the market. Joining us to discuss the broader outlook for the FANG stocks is CFRA's Director of Equity Research, Scott Kessler, from his 
office in New York. And in our office in New York, Bloomberg Markets reporter Romain Bostic is back, back with us. Scott, I'll ask you here. We're seeing other FANG stocks rise on the back of Alphabet earnings. Uh, does Alphabet get any credit for uh, driving this broader tech momentum in spite of, of Netflix's whiff last week? Yeah, so thanks a lot, Emily. Um, you know, obviously, I think people are looking at Alphabet as a bellwether, and rightly so. Um, the fact that the company delivered 26% uh, organic revenue growth for a company of this size, I think says a lot about Alphabet and Google, but also probably says something about the broader environment from a spending perspective. I'd also point out that as strong as Alphabet's results were, the stock is only up around 4% in after hours trading. And what's interesting about that, in my opinion, is that if you look at the FANG names, both Alphabet and Apple have been underperforming the S&P 500 technology sector year to date through today, not including the after hours action. Romain, would you concur? Well, it is a good point. I mean, if you look at uh, Apple, Amazon, you look at all the, the FANG stocks, they've, they have underperformed the S&P 500. They've underperformed even the broader NASDAQ. Uh, you know, and I think going into this earnings season, one thing that you didn't see was that type of run-up in shares that we often get in some of these names. We did get a little bit of run-up in Facebook. That was probably uh, the most notable, up about 2% over the past week. And there was about a 1% jump in Google. But a lot of the other names have really sort of been trending water as I think folks are trying to decide whether this is a long-term growth story. I think some of that was settled today with Alphabet and we'll see that later this week with Facebook and of course with Amazon but when you have stocks that are trading at or near all-time highs when you've had this sort of 30% uh, earnings growth on some of these names you have to wonder if we have reached a peak and whether investors want to stick around to find out if we're going to go down the other side of that slope. Well, and on that point, I do have a chart here in my GTV library, which shows that uh, Alphabet's revenue growth, despite its strength, still trails that of Facebook, Amazon, and Netflix. I mean, and, and, and Facebook, despite all of the controversies that Facebook has been going through over the last uh, several months. Scott, you know, uh, what do you read into this? Well, first of all, I just wanted to clarify that I was referring to year-to-date performance. We've seen Netflix up 88%, Amazon up 55%, Facebook up 19%. I think the broader tech sector in the S&P 500 is up 15%. So there's kind of a disparity in performance among the FANG names. Last year, we saw the tech sector up between 30 and 60 percent and all the fang names were up that amount as well so i think that's one thing that people need to keep in mind is the performance has been more diverse this year among the fang names than last year now emily you pointed out the revenue growth i think a lot of people were taken aback and astounded by the fact that last week um, Microsoft put up 17% revenue growth. And one of the things that I pointed out, which is important to keep in mind as we're going through earnings season, particularly this week, is one wonders if this is going to be a peak in terms of revenue growth for some of these names. And whether it's for cyclical or secular reasons, um, that's something that I think is important to keep in mind. How much better can it get? for these companies, Alphabet, 26% revenue growth, how sustainable is that? I don't know if that's gonna be sustainable over the next couple of years, perhaps the next couple of quarters. And what about Facebook? You downgraded Facebook from buy to hold. Obviously, we know about uh, the data scandals that they have been weathering, and yet the stock mm -hmm. has you know, really shrugged that off. Are you concerned about engagement? Are you concerned about user growth? Yeah. So. You're right that we downgraded the stock after just a tremendous snapback following the Cambridge Analytical revelations. Uh, that being said, however, we do have some concerns about Facebook. Um, they include not just what's going to happen as a result of Cambridge Analytica and further scrutiny related to data and personal privacy, but also the notion that we think the, the Facebook platform is not a place for growth anymore. And outside of Instagram, you think about Messenger and monetization plans there, and remember Oculus VR? I think there are big questions that at some point Facebook's going to have to answer now. That might not necessarily happen now because Instagram has been so successful, but even point to video 
on Facebook. We've been hearing about that being a major growth driver from a monetization and revenue perspective for a couple of years. And I don't know that we've really seen that, which is a plus in terms of a future opportunity, but a negative perhaps in terms of near-term execution. Meantime, Romaine, we've also got Amazon coming up. We're going to talk a little bit momentarily about the president's ire towards uh, Jeff Bezos and the, the Washington Post. But that aside, um, what are you expecting when it comes to um, Amazon, you know, given, we, you know, we saw a fairly uh, strong Prime Day and Amazon expanding its tentacles into all of these new categories. Yeah, Amazon is one of these stocks where they're basically writing their own story and most investors uh, view this as a company that not just has a great deal of dominance uh, in their respective areas, but it really can just sort of change things at will. And I think uh, at least when you take out the sort of the political issues out there, uh, it's a company that a lot of folks see as able to sort of just, you know, grow at will, uh, including as as long as it spends it will but for right now investors are fine with that and I should also point out too just with Amazon and with a lot of these other fang names they've really become sort of a, a little bit of haven uh, assets uh, for a lot of investors in this market who are worried about some of the political issues out there so they're turning to the alphabets they're turning to the Facebook's and the Amazon's because they feel that at a minimum these are companies that can sort of weather the storms of the geopolitics and of the trade issues as long as they continue to spend and grow Grow. All right, Romaine Bostic, Bloomberg Markets, thank you so much, as well as CFRA Director of Equity Research, Scott Kessler. We are going to continue to cover all of these companies reporting throughout the week. Speaking of Amazon, coming up, President Trump has resumed his public campaign against billionaire Jeff Bezos by calling his newspaper, The Washington Post, an expensive lobbyist for Amazon. We've got details on the dig next. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg should learn the Trump administration will try to revoke California's authority to regulate car emissions, including its mandate for electric car sales. The proposed revision of Obama-era standards is expected to be released this week. The proposed revamp would also put the brakes on federal rules to boost fuel efficiency into the next decade and instead would cap federal fuel economy requirements at the 2020 level. We're going to dig into the implications for the electronic vehicle industry later this hour. Speaking of President Trump, he's taking aim at two familiar targets in the U.S., Amazon and The Washington Post. Both are controlled by the richest person in the world, and that is Jeff Bezos. The president says the Post is nothing more than an expensive lobbyist for Amazon, and he says many people believe Amazon should face antitrust charges. Shares of Amazon have since fallen. Joining us now with more from Washington is Bloomberg's Ben Brody, who covers tech lobbying uh, for us. So, Ben, can President Trump really have a negative impact on Amazon here? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. There are a lot of ways that Amazon has nexuses with the government. It's pursuing uh, government contracts. It obviously could have these antitrust investigations, all other kinds of things. It's aspirations in the healthcare space. But what it ultimately comes down to is while Trump can pressure the Department of Justice or the Federal Trade Commission, they probably are guarding their independence and anything that they would want to do would take months, if not years of investigation to ultimately pull off. And I think what we saw today is that it's not even clear that he can really dent their stock price uh, for more than maybe a morning. So uh, is this about Amazon or is this about The Washington Post? <laughs> Uh, this is uh, this is about the Washington Post. This is about Jeff Bezos. This is about uh, a feud between two billionaires. Uh, Amazon certainly has lots of very expensive lobbyists. It could probably do better uh, than a newspaper that actually has uh, criticized the company and, and has not not been shy about uh, covering the company. The exact tweet, in my opinion, the Washington Post is nothing more than ex an expensive the paper loses a fortune. Lobbyists for Amazon, it is used as protection against antitrust claims which many feel should be brought. Is it used as protection against antitrust claims which many feel should be brought? Could antitrust claims be brought? 
Uh, there are a lot of critics, certainly. There is a, a sort of young group of activists who call themselves the hipster antitrust movement. Uh, that's sort of something that critics have called them and they've called themselves. And they have trained a lot of fire on Amazon. They have said that it's using different parts of its business line to uh, subsidize predatory pricing. They've said that it's uh, third party sellers that sell on its marketplace. It's basically competing against them and that these raise uh, major antitrust concerns. On the other side, you have a company that is broadly popular with consumers. It's not clear that there's uh, a lot of consumer harm here. And it's also not clear that in the relevant business lines it has the market share to really be uh, dominant in the way that the FTC and the DOJ would be looking into it. What does Amazon lobbying actually look like and how does it compare to other tech companies? Uh, sure, it's uh, it's much more traditional. It, you know, it focuses on uh, Congress and the agencies. It is uh, the lobbying that has probably, or it has, in fact, grown fastest over the last five or six years. And in many ways, it probably is the broadest in terms of the number of government agencies that they are really uh, going out there and talking to. Now, we found out just on Friday that the company set a quarterly record for lobbying, so it is uh, a very big force uh, here in the district. Uh, but I think the other thing that you see is uh, you see Facebook setting records as it was facing Cambridge Analytica and you see Google, uh, you know, which of course reported today, uh, spending uh, more than either of those companies, almost almost what uh, the two of them are combined. So uh, it's it's fighting a fight, but there are a lot of tech companies that are uh, literally spending millions of dollars to lobby every quarter. Uh, there was that recent Supreme Court ruling that does affect Amazon and other e-commerce companies. You know, what's the real impact of that? Yeah, that's a great question. That's one of the things Trump was saying, that, that Amazon had lost the case, that Washington Post had lost the case. Of course, neither was actually a, a party to the case, which sort of lets uh, local and state government jurisdictions uh, charge sales tax for these online sales, even if there's not a sort of physical presence for the store. Now, Amazon had uh, been collecting these tax when you're looking at sales uh, of its own merchandise. The question really comes, what happens now that those third-party merchants who use Amazon as a retail platform and now face new tax burdens. Are they going to get off online sales? Are they going to go to Amazon for compliance? Or is it going to be something else? The company itself sort of survived when it started collecting its own sales tax. But what happens to those merchants? They're about half the sales. It's unclear. All right. Bloomberg's Ben Brody. Thanks so much. We'll be watching the president's tweets. Coming up, more from Alphabet's home run earnings. Google CEO Sundar Pichai spoke on the conference call saying Google will be investing more in hiring people in emerging markets like Indonesia and India. Here he is on growth in emerging markets in particular. Take a listen. The user growth there uh, is, uh, you know, extraordinary to see. And we are seeing it across all our products. So all our major products, products which have over a billion users each, uh, they are all doing well in these markets. And so uh, that's where most of the growth is going to come from. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Back to our top story, a huge win for Alphabet this quarter, pretty much beating on all metrics. Google is still raking in marketing dollars from advertisers, propelling the online search giant to another strong quarter. This in the face of, of course, costly regulatory trouble in Europe, shares popping after hours. Google CEO Sundar Pichai, speaking on the earnings call, talked about emerging markets, AI, the cloud. He said there is an inflection point when commenting on the cloud. Let's turn now to our expert roundtable to really dig in. Through some of these highlights, we've got Jachendra Wall of Bloomberg Intelligence and Bloomberg Tech's very own Andy Pollack. Jachendra, we always want more information about the cloud, and they so rarely give it. So what do you think he means by there? We, there is an inflection point. So there are two things that he mentions. One, the other segment continues to sort of show a robust revenue growth. The cloud is in there. Uh, but also, he also talked about diversification. So a lot of companies now are looking to not just partner with one cloud company, like have your own entire business on Amazon, but also sort of spread those 
bets, if you may. So there's enough room. If you actually look at the end market, there's enough room for Microsoft, Google, and Amazon to pay. So this diversification also benefits. So basically, you know, if you sort of put those things together, you're talking about an end market that's growing more than 35% compounded growth for the next five to six years. So all these players have enough room to grow. Do you think Google strongly. could rival Amazon in the cloud, though? The, I, because the end market is real, that big. So if we have, when we look at our sizing, by 2025, we expect that market to be upwards of $350 billion. So basically, there's a lot of room for three players. And there's a lot of barriers to entry as well, right? Not everybody can compete in this, uh, in this marketplace. So because of that and the diversification angle, you know, we think there's enough room for three of them to post robust growth. There are, of course, looming headwinds in Europe. Google is appealing uh, the ruling of the European Commission. But in the meantime, they are going to accrue this five billion dollar fine. Um, Ruth Porat, in a phone call with me, uh, didn't go into detail about that, but she did talk a little bit about GDPR, which of course also came out of Europe. And these are new privacy regulations that some thought could hurt Google's bottom line. But it appears that Google might actually be benefiting from GDPR because other smaller companies have had trouble becoming GDPR compliant, uh, you know, Ruth Porat talked a lot about GDPR and how, you know, the main thing she said is we have a long history in this, meaning privacy, we care immensely about it. We've been working closely with publishers and advertisers to make sure we get it right. And she talked about some of the measures that they have implemented and other things that they are working on. You know, what do you make, Andy, of the fact that some of these rules were, were designed to, uh, you, know, d you know, share the wealth? if you will, but in fact it's only concentrated the wealth. Well, the privacy regulations, you're right. I think more advertisers trust Google. They've been doing this for a long time. The size of the uh, company is so big, they know how to handle it much better than smaller, uh, uh, smaller companies would. So I think that you're right, In it's kind of a, in the opposite of what people thought, the privacy regulations are going to help advertisers just put their business in with Google and keep it there because they know it'll be the privacy regulations will be followed properly. Now, although Ruth Porat deferred questions on uh, the European Commission ruling, Sundar Pichai did address it on the call. Take a listen to what he had to say. We will always take a constructive approach. We'll appeal the uh, Commission's decision and take the due process available to us. Uh, but we're also looking forward to finding a solution uh, above all that preserves the uh, uh, you know, enormous benefits of Android to users and so on. So uh, there is more work to be done and, and I think it'll become clearer as we go along. But I'm confident that we can find a way to make sure Android is available at scale uh, to, to users everywhere. So Jitendra, appeal aside, do you think Google could be forced to fundamentally change its business model? If handset makers start charging Google to pre-install Google apps on these smartphones, how much could that hit the bottom line? So it, that's not a fundamental change in business model, right? Because that is their current business model. They do that with Apple today, uh, aggressively. So right, we don't, but the we handset don't think makers are contractually now obligated to do this, and now they would have to they could potentially charge Google. Yeah. To so do one, it. Of, one of the big surprises this this uh, earnings uh, call was basically the traffic acquisition cost growth mm -hmm. was moderating, right? And 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 that was interesting to actually see in the context of what he just said about how you know we, they could think about solutions of how to make Android available globally. And I feel if their attack increases and there might be uh, based on you know what what's happening right now. The volume growth in itself is so strong that it more than offsets it. And that's what we have seen for the last couple of quarters as well. You know, they printed 58% increase in paid clicks. That is a per, that's after printing 59% last quarter. So that's telling you, you know, how these guys are balancing basically the demand that they have in advertising with the in ongoing increase in cost. But a lot of traffic acquisition costs seem to be moderating. So it was interesting that they didn't give a sterner warning about these costs going up in the second half uh, aggressively or things like like that on the back of whatever's happening with EU. So I think we still have to wait and see if any of the changes uh, could surprise. But so far, it looks like the surprises are low. And if it does come, it's going to be long term. Can Google's competitors in search take advantage of this? Can, and there's a lot of doubt whether they can right now. So I think it's a long term issue more than a short term concern for the bottom line. 
But Chai also spent some time talking about emerging markets. Chitendra, I know you took a, a more specific look at what's going on in Asia. You know, what are you seeing elsewhere outside the U.S.? Yeah, they're basically seeing a lot of these new product launches like Taze in India and, you know, a lot of uh, investments in other emerging markets start to sort of see a lot of user growth. So that prints them a long-term tail for revenue growth. I mean, they're seeing strong growth this quarter and the contribution will continue. But what they're doing is making a foundation, if you may, for that long-term revenue growth coming from these uh, economies. So, so that, that those investments uh, might actually see uh, a better ROI than, than, than we think longer term. Now, going into this, uh, in the break, we were talking about uh, all uh, Sundar Pichai was doing to tout machine learning and AI uh, at Google and, and whether or not Google is really backing it up. Andy, do you think they are? Well, we're starting to see it, but I think it's a very difficult thing to measure. I mean, uh, how AI helps their search, does it uh, make it more targeted, how can we see it? Uh, you know, I think it's a difficult thing to measure, though they tout it all the time, so. That, and that's an advantage to Google because the competition can't really see how they're increasing ROI for advertisers. Mm -hmm. uh, so basically this, um, uh, this call, every product they mentioned, they talked about machine learning in conjunction with that product category, including hardware, search, YouTube, maps. So basically what you're going to end up seeing is the relevance of searches, the relevance of the per service that they're offering to advertisers, the return on investment advertisers are getting are, are increasing with these, with these machine learning uh, sort of ongoing investments in every product category. And that means longer term, higher margin sales. So, so. And what should we be watching? And obviously we've got a raft of earnings coming up. We've seen the broader market and the FANG stocks in particular lift on the back of Alphabet earnings. I think you, you've spoken earlier about Facebook and uh, the issues that they've had. Uh, I think people are looking at Amazon to see if the, uh, you know, the money making continues. They've had a great, they had a great prime day. We're not going to see that in this earnings report, but uh, how well they did, I think. Um, and uh, will the investors continue to push those stock prices up and up and up? But Google's going to, uh, Alphabet, excuse me, is going to have a record tomorrow again. Uh, Amazon's setting records. Um, I think that's another thing to watch for. Jatendra, what are you watching? Uh, well, this has basically set the stage for Facebook, Amazon's advertising business and internet segment in general to really print positive results because, you know, we looked at the pay click number, that, which is a sign of demand and the demand is very strong. And we're seeing, you know, this year mobile advertising expected to grow upwards of 28%. So the end market being strong plus the market share of these companies being consistently growing and limited impact so far seen from regulatory risks and things like that. When you combine all these, you set up for a very strong earnings season. All right, Jitendra Gawal of Bloomberg Intelligence, Andy Pollock, our Bloomberg Tech Editor. Thank, Thank you. you both. Lots to talk about this week. Well, some disappointing news for iPhone users. The latest Apple iPhone models trail the latest smartphones from Samsung and Alphabet's Google when it comes to download speeds. That's according to data firm Ookla. Ookla says it hosts millions of tests a day. The data breakdown indicated the iPhone 10 operated fastest on Verizon's wireless network with average speeds of 31.5 megabits per second. The Galaxy S9 Plus, which is closest to the iPhone 10 in terms of price, recorded average speeds of 38.2 megabits per second on Verizon. Still ahead, Los Angeles has been making a name for itself in tech. We're going to talk about Silicon Beach's growing tech scene coming up. Plus. Tesla calls for help. Should investors be worried? This is Bloomberg. <laughs> Tinder, The Honest Company, Hulu, CrowdStrike, SpaceX, Snap. What do all of these companies have in common? Well, they all successfully launched their businesses in Southern California. In 2017, Southern California Tech raised billions of dollars, launching a new batch of startups and attracting funding support from local investors. Here to discuss, Jamie Montgomery, Managing Director of March Capital Partners, a leading LA-based investment bank. He's also founder of Mon the Montgomery Summit, which is often described as the South by Southwest of LA. Uh, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. It's Great been a to while. Be here. Thank you. So, what trends are you seeing in LA and Silicon Beach, if you will, um, that may, we may not be seeing in Silicon Valley? Oh, that's a good. Well, we think about it every day, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's great to be back on Bloomberg. So, Los Angeles 
is the ecosystem, we kind of consider it San Diego to Santa Barbara, the Southern California. It's a large engineering base there. So we're starting to see more and more enterprise technology companies that we hadn't seen traditionally there. We're getting some leadership coming down from the Bay Area and sales and marketing and executive leadership. We've had some great companies come out of SoCal, Illumina, ServiceNow, CrowdStrike. These are very large companies. The media companies usually get more attention because the media loves to write about media, but we're building some great enterprise tech companies down there, so that might be a bit of a surprise. And is there an advantage, you think, to you know, founding or headquartering in LA as opposed to San Francisco? Oh, I think you need the best of both, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's, so, it's very expensive up here to attract and retain talent. Uh, there's, pools of talent down there that Google's taken advantage of and others have and I think to have a successful company you really need to have a foot in each camp. But there are certain advantages. You can build engineering teams down there and retain the engineers more likely. Up here our companies are always under attack for talent. Yeah. Uh, you've been doing this a long time and I know AI in particular is something that you're really interested in. We've yeah. been talking about Google touting its own AI capabilities. What are some of the unique trends that you're seeing in AI that we need to look out for? Well, the advantages of CrowdStrike would have is the massive data sets. They have over 5 million endpoints with sensors. Say, so look at 18 billion incidents a day and make 2.3 million decisions per second. So we look for companies that can get massive data sets and then train their algorithms to run over that. Another example is Descartes Labs, uh, another one are Forder. So you have three or four companies with massive data sets. So it's really getting access to the data. You could argue whether Microsoft or Google had the better algorithms, but Google had the bigger data set and much as impossible to compete with. Well, and it's controversial because, you know, a lot of us are now wondering, well, what data do they actually have on me and do I know about it and how are they using it and who are they giving it to? They have everything and you have no idea what they're doing with it. So. Do you think yeah. that could be a fundamental um, flaw, to, you know, for a company like Facebook given that trust has been undermined over the last several months or do people ultimately not really care? Well, I don't know, I don't know if there's been a price put on it mm. yet. You know, people care at some price. If it's free, you know, you saw the hearings. It was kind of a clown show. It was a great buy at $150 a share of Facebook. But, I mean, it's a great company and so is Google, but there's been no price put on privacy. And when there was a price we'll figure out what it's worth to people. So, what other trends are you really excited about? Well, we're very interested in the whole area of industry X.0. Industry 4.0, Industry 2025. What's Industry 4.0? Well, so the manufacturing sector is anywhere between 20 and 40 percent of most countries' GDP, and it's an area where technology really hasn't hit yet. You see operational technology, but not information technology. And the information technology is starting to hit the manufacturing world to streamline processes, improve efficiency, increase safety, reduce cost, and it's a, just a massive area. It's going to be a long process of building this out. It's going to take five or ten years to see it really roll out in companies like Honeywell, GE, Rockwell, and their supplier base. But that's a massive, massive industry that we're excited about, and we're building some good-sized companies there. What about when it comes to the techification of cars, you know, oh, yeah. we talk a lot about Tesla, but obviously, uh, you know, there are the incumbents and, and the GMs uh, of the world, which have been making cars for many, many years, yeah. um, you know, but Tesla has sort of become a market leader. Can yeah. uh, the established automakers uh, catch up? Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. And I think, you know, you talked about Google earnings today on the mm -hmm. news. I mean, I think you, you're buying a great company with Google at this price, but you probably get Waymo for free and maybe the cloud for free as well. There's still a lot of optionality in Google. Well, and I talked to Ruth Poor at the CFO of Alphabet, and she was very optimistic about Waymo's uh, yeah. prospects, and yet analysts are, uh, have no idea when it'll actually be a significant contributor to revenue. They have no idea. Yeah, yeah. maybe and look at Baidu in China, same thing. I mean, uh, it's... Uh, I talked to Robin Lee, he has no idea how big it's going to be, and he's the CEO of Baidu. I mean, it's going to be a massive market. Just put a couple thousand dollars per car, multiply the number of cars, and that's the size of the market. So, I mean, it's a, it's a massive market. I think you're getting that for free in the Google stock would be my only comment on today's earnings. But Southern California's got a lot of expertise in navigation systems, uh, robotics, uh, LiDAR, some of the key components of uh, automated vehicles. You see that manifest in some of the research coming out of uh, JPL and other companies down there. Now, you do the Montgomery Summit every year, and you've been doing summits like this since before 
most people were doing sentences yeah, like this. But now yeah. there's a lot of competition. You know, what is your differentiator? What what will make the Montgomery you know, we, special? We, we, this we're coming? a moving target. You know, we try and continue to stay ahead of the competition. Uh, this year, we're very interested in quantum computing. I think it's mm -hmm. closer than people think. AI will be a big theme. Uh, this will be our fourth year we've had a large women's conference as well. We had our, over 400 women there this last year. We're um, super excited about that. So you know, we're, I like we're, to hear that. We're, 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 we just stay ahead <laughs> of the pack. You know, it's, it's, I love competition. Competition's good. We learn, we listen, we watch, and then we pounce on it. And, and we also have a lot of fun down in Southern California. People love coming down for a couple of days. And our guests stay f and they interact. You were f great with Eric Schmidt, and he you know, hung around and met with everybody he could. He, Popped by and saw Evan Spiegel on the way over. He went and spoke at a local university. So that's pretty typical. People really kind of engage that they don't come in the green room and leave. They're there talking to the entrepreneurs, mentoring them, coaching them. And that's what makes it special. That was light years ago. Well, <laughs> um, but it's so good to see you still going. Jamie Montgomery, founder of the Montgomery Summit and founder and managing director of March Capital Partners. Thank Thanks you. So much Thank you for stopping by. Thanks. Coming up. Tesla is reportedly requesting cash back from suppliers. Will this turn a profit or hurt future operations? That's next. This is Bloomberg. Tesla alarms investors yet again as reports surface that the company is trying to get refunds from suppliers. Tesla shares dropped Monday following the release of a memo in which the electric car company requested a return on a, quote, meaningful amount of payment since 2016. The memo, according to a report from the Wall Street Journal, calls on all suppliers to help the automaker turn a profit, raising questions about the company's cash position and mass production. While Tesla managed to hit its target to produce 5,000 Model 3s in one week, many doubt that that can be sustained. Here to discuss further, Max Chafkin from Bloomberg Business Week. First of all, Max, did they not think that these emails would leak to the press? You know, that the pattern has been that pretty much anything that comes out of Tesla will eventually leak out. So you, so you have to think that they were uh, expecting this. Uh, Tesla also, you know, confirmed to the, to the journal that something like this was going on. And Elon Musk tweeted about it, saying that, you know, basically clarifying some of the accounting issues around um, these potential uh, refunds or, or rebates or whatever. And so, I, yeah, I mean, I think this was kind of planned. I mean, it's part of their strategy to try to do everything they can to, um, you know, get their finances in order, get as many cars out the door and, and, and get to cash flow positive uh, as soon as possible. Okay, but are investors going to buy it knowing this is how they got it done? Well, it didn't it didn't go super well today. The stock was down. Um, uh, I think that, you know, it, it sort of depends on your point of view, I guess. I think on one hand, if, if you're an investor and, and you're concerned about their uh, their cash position, you could say, well, it's great. They're 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 taking advantage of their leverage. Um, if you're running out of cash, you, you, you obviously have more leverage in a negotiation and they're and they're getting a discount. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, yeah, it, it just doesn't look totally sustainable. We're seeing a lot of stuff out of Tesla over the past few months. Uh, from you know worker, workers uh, you know describing very long hours to Elon Musk describing very long hours to this tent where they were making the car now to this supplier issue where you have a lot of stuff that that feels kind of um, slapped together and and I think that is you know that could be bad from your point of view or it could be a sign of a company that's really just doing everything uh, that it can to, to get it done. I do have this chart here in my GTV library uh, showing Tesla short interest spiking and then fading. Is there an argument to be made that this is a good thing? Uh, that that which is a good thing that 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 Tesla sending these emails, um, you know, trying to get their money back is a good thing. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think the argument is that, you know, like I said, that they're just doing everything they can. And I also think there is, you know, from, from the point of view of Tesla, right, they're, they're growing their customer base, base very rapidly. So they have a lot more market power today than they did, say, two years ago, back in 2006. So it's sort of sensible to say, hey, you know, you got to give us a better deal now. We're, we're, we're a bigger thing. Um, what's, what's a little unusual is the idea of sort of retroactively asking um, for money. Money. And it also it doesn't necessarily look like a company that's you know got its feet under it. How might this impact our future plans? The Model Y, the Semi, all of the grand ambitions that Elon Musk otherwise has for this company. Yeah, I mean this is this is something that I've been thinking about, especially with respect to the layoffs we saw uh, a, a, you know a few weeks back, where they laid off nine percent of their staff. Um, you know, if you're doing everything you can. To, to get now to look really good, that makes the future sort of a lot harder to, to, to sort of figure out. And, and Tesla has, has done really well getting keeping people focused on the future, saying, yeah, this is what we're doing now, but we've got this great new car, this new technology uh, coming out. And it, it's, it's harder to see how they're going to you know, get the Model Y, which is this uh, compact SUV, out as, as quickly as they probably would like to, or, or, or some of the other far out things. And, and you sort of start to worry that investors stop looking at this as a company company that is, you know, all about the future and think about it more as a company that's, you know, really managing itself quarter to quarter, which obviously I don't think is what, you know, Elon Musk wants or, or envisioned. All right. Well, we'll be watching to see how these suppliers respond. Max Chafkin from Bloomberg Business Week. Thank you, as always, for weighing in on Tesla. And here is a wrap of Alphabet's second quarter. Revenue beat all expectations, a sign that Google's core ad business is still firing on all cylinders, despite concerns about privacy and Amazon getting into the sp space. Shares rallied as high as 5% in late trading, and an emerging story this earnings season is cloud, doing well for everyone. Take a listen to Google CEO Sundar Pichai on the call talking about the cloud. It feels far from a zero-sum game. I think all the all the major players are definitely seeing traction, um, and and to me the reason is you know typically when you look at enterprises you know you, you once you've deployed and you have an architecture, you try and stay on it as long as you can uh, for, for in many many cases uh, because change is hard. But you know this is a case in which the benefits are super clear, and and over time I think there's a tremendous cost to your business of being on the wrong architecture. Google CEO Sundar Pichai there weighing in on the back of Amazon's strong earnings results. We're going to have earnings results all week. Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, all right here on Bloomberg Technology. That does it for this edition of the show. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg.